What if there were no Disney theme parks? I mean, no Walt Disney World, no Disney theme parks abroad, no Disneyland, nothing. Disneyland opened in 1955, but what if Disneyland were being built for the very first time in the here and now, in current times? How would a Disneyland built in the 2020s be different than the one built in the 1950s? Here is a Walt Disney quote that explains the original intent of the turn of the century theming on Main Street. For those of us who remember the carefree time it recreates, Main Street will bring back happy memories. For younger visitors, it is an adventure in turning back the calendar to the days of their grandfather's youth. Disneyland opened its gates in 1955, but in order to honor Walt's original intent of Main Street USA, if the park were being built today, the decade would have to change. Unlike in 1955, today nobody alive was around during the turn of the century to remember. But older visitors do have their own memories of a carefree time on the Main Street they grew up on. Disneyland's 1955 Main Street was a romanticized recreation of the early part of the 20th century, circa 1910. That is 45 years before 1955. So to get the same effect with people alive today, we have to turn the clock back 45 years. This video was made in 2022, so 2022 minus 45 years would make the theme of Main Street USA 1977. So let's take a look at what a Main Street USA, circa 1977, could look like? What are the sights, sounds, and smells that would bring back fun nostalgic memories of the 1970s to Main Street that older guests could share with younger guests? To be clear, this is not a suggestion that the actual Main Street change its theme. It is beloved as is. This is a hypothetical Main Street if it were built for the very first time right now. Let's start with the Penny Arcade. Video arcades were very important to us kids in the 1970s. But first, let's take a look at the amusement machines found during the turn of the century featured in the Penny Arcade. At the entrance of the Penny Arcade, still to this day, you are greeted by Esmeralda, the fortune teller who will give you a fortune card with a prediction. Once in the arcade, you used to see several antique kaleoscopes and mudoscopes, arcade consoles that you looked into and turned a crank by hand, which flipped images into your view, creating primitive animation, much like a flipbook. From 1955 to 1962, the original Penny Arcade included a shooting gallery, which closed when the Safari Shooting Gallery opened in Adventureland in 62. In the back of the Penny Arcade, you will find an old-fashioned orchestrion, a machine that plays music designed to sound like an orchestra or band. Here you can hear songs from the turn of the century. Currently, the Penny Arcade is found within the Candy Palace, but originally these two concepts each got their own distinct locations. Since video games skyrocketed in popularity in the 1970s, I think a Disneyland built today should have a dedicated space just for the arcade. A penny wouldn't buy you much fun in an arcade in the 1970s. So perhaps a name change would be in order from Penny Arcade to Quarter Arcade or even Video Arcade. The arcade would be designed to bring back memories of riding your bike to the local arcade, putting a quarter on the arcade console while your friends battle it out with space aliens. Here are some of the machines that it could feature. Pong, a video game based on the tennis-inspired ping pong, which debuted at Andy Capps Tavern in Sunnyvale, California in 1972, was the very first commercially successful arcade game. Seawolf is a 1976 video game inspired by a 1960s electromechanical game called Periscope. Periscope popularized the American cost of a quarter for arcade games. Cardboard cutouts of ships were moved across a chain for you to launch torpedoes at. Fans of this electromechanical game were blown away by the new video game version, The Seawolf, which became the highest grossing video game of 1976 in the United States. Space Invaders came out in 1978 on the heels of the 1970s space craze, fueled by the original Star Wars, and became the most successful video game of the decade. Inspired by the competing video game Space Invaders and the cinematic combat scenes in the original Star Wars film, 1979's Galaxian was one of the first video games with color graphics. Computer Space, the very first arcade video game from 1971, would make the Quarter Arcade double as a video game museum, in addition to a place to have nostalgic fun. Some other video games for the arcade could be 1976 Breakout, 1979's Lunar Landing, and 1979's Asteroids.
The golden age of video arcade games started in the 1970s and reached its peak in the early 1980s. To keep the theme authentic to the 1970s, popular 1980s arcade games such as Pac-Man and Donkey Kong would not be present. However, there would be a few games beyond just video games, such as Ski Ball and a few pinball games such as 1979's Kiss Pinball and 1976's Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy featuring Elton John. Instead of an orchestrion, a 1970s arcade would have a jukebox with tunes from the 1970s and 1960s to entertain the game players. One-way transportation from the plaza to the hub is provided by turn-of-the-century vehicles such as the horse-drawn streetcar, the omnibus, the fire engine, and the jitney. This fleet of vehicles would need a 1970s overhaul that could include either a VW bus or Chevy minivan, a 1977 Ford Pinto cruising wagon, a 1970 orange Datsun 510, because in what other decade would an orange car not stick out? A Ford station wagon complete with wood paneling on both sides, and to cross-promote the 1968 live-action Disney film, The Love Bug, guests would be able to take a joyride in The Love Bug itself. Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln has been a staple on Main Street in the Disneyland Opera House for years and pays tribute to the 16th President of the United States. In the 1970s, our entire nation celebrated its bicentennial celebration in 1976, including America on Parade in both Disneyland and Walt Disney World. Instead of Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, a 1970s-themed Disneyland Opera House could feature a show specifically commemorating the bicentennial. Now, let's take a look at the Main Street Cinema. Originally, the Main Street Cinema showcased silent black and white films from the turn of the century, such as The Great Train Robbery, the very first Western film from 1903, Gertie the Dinosaur, a 1914 film that inspired an ice cream stand in Disney's Hollywood Studios. A Girl and Her Trust, a 1912 film. Only film with sound was 1928's Steamboat Willie, the first film distributed to feature Mickey and Minnie Mouse and one of the very first cartoons with synchronized sound. In the 1980s, the Main Street Cinema changed gears by replacing the classic silent films with just Mickey Mouse and Friends cartoons from the 1920s and 1930s. Well, I have no doubt this brought back happy memories for grandparents in the 1950s of spending their youth at the silent cinema at the turn of the century. To get the same effect in the 2020s, a 1970s version of the Main Street Cinema would be turned into the Main Street Six since multiplexes gained popularity in the 70s. Films representative of the 1970s to be featured could include 1975's Jaws, since it was the highest grossing film up until that time and catapulted the blockbuster as a summer staple for moviegoers in the 1970s. 1972's The Godfather. Too violent, you say? Perhaps. But the pirates in the attraction, Pirates of the Caribbean, are probably every bit as violent. And for some reason, we all look the other way when it comes to the violence in Star Wars. And Star Wars recently got a whole land, Galaxy's Edge in Disneyland. Speaking of Star Wars, Star Wars, not a new hope, but just Star Wars, as it was known in 1977, will be shown. It wasn't until the release of The Empire Strikes Back that there was a need to coin the retronym A New Hope to distinguish the 1977 movie from the 1980 movie. In the 70s, the 50s made a nostalgic comeback in pop culture, so it would make sense to show 1973's American Graffiti or 1978's Grease. Other films could be 1977's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1976's Rocky, and 1977's Saturday Night Fever. But perhaps this is the wrong approach. The actual Main Street Cinema shifted gears from showing films that best represented the turn of the century to Mickey Mouse cartoons in the 1980s. Perhaps Disney would be more inclined to pick 1970s films that promote intellectual properties that Disney themselves own to make the attraction more synergistic. So let's take a second look with only Disney-owned flicks. Even though Star Wars wasn't owned by Disney in the 1970s, it is now, so it's the one pick that can stay. The Muppets are owned by Disney, so they could show the original 1979 Muppet movie. When Kermit sings Rainbow Connection, playing his banjo on a lily pad in a swamp, every 50-something-year-old becomes an 8-year-old all over again. 
Disney now owns movies from 20th Century Fox, so 1979's Alien and 1974's The Towering Inferno could play. Disaster films were a staple of the 1970s, and The Towering Inferno is the movie that inspired the 1978 dance hit Disco Inferno, a song that some say is about people disco dancing the night away, unaware that a lower floor of the skyscraper they're dancing in is catching on fire. Rocky Horror Picture Show is also a 20th Century Fox movie. Well, this entry may be a little racy for a Disney theme park, it is the only 1970s film that has played consistently in movie theaters ever since the 1970s. Due to its popularity as a midnight movie, this certainly gives it historical significance. And let's not forget to include an actual Disney film, 1977's The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. After all, Winnie the Pooh wasn't just a movie star, but also was nominated for president in 1972 on the Children's Party ticket. The department store Sears selected delegates from each of the 50 states to be sent with their families to Walt Disney World. Now, there's a honey of a candidate we can all get behind. From 1973 to 1989, Main Street had a preview of coming attractions exhibit that showcased the upcoming, but never materialized, lands of Discovery Bay and Dumbo Circus. Since our 1970s theme Main Street would only exist if Disneyland were brand new, a preview center would make perfect sense to build excitement for phase two of this version of Disneyland. Whatever that would be. The Coca-Cola Refreshment Corner, commonly referred to as Coke Corner, has been a staple since 1955. Guests can enjoy a refreshing Coke product while listening to a ragtime piano player tickle the ivories. For a 1970s version of Coke Corner, perhaps instead of a ragtime piano player, there is a DJ playing 1970s disco tunes, or a guitar player singing the early 1970s singer and songwriter tunes. Regardless of the music, one thing is for sure, the beverages would be very different. Of course, Coca-Cola would be served, but it would be made with actual sugar and not high fructose corn syrup, which started in 1980. As for diet drinks, diet Coke would be glaringly missing from the menu. Instead of Diet Coke, the Diet Cola of choice would be Tab. And for those who want a citrus alternative from Cola, Fresca would also be served. The one major difference between the Tab and Fresca of the 1970s and the Tab and Fresca served in a modern 1970s themed Main Street is the sugar substitute used and whether there is an awful aftertaste. Diet sodas in the 1970s used saccharin, an artificial sweetener which during the 70s required a warning label that read, use of this product may be hazardous to your health. This product contains saccharin, which has been determined to cause cancer in laboratory animals. This saccharin warning required requirement was dropped in the year 2000. One study showed that human bodies react differently to the substance than rats. Even though it may be safe for humans after all, the versions of Tab and Fresca served at our 1970s theme Coke Corner would not be made with saccharin. While today's older generations may be nostalgic for Tab and Fresca, they would be very wary of drinking anything with saccharin with its awful aftertaste. But then again, the bitter Italian beverage Beverly is a huge hit in Epcot, so who knows? Another way that drink options could be themed to the 1970s is drink sizes. If we look at McDonald's as a guide, a small size soda in the 1970s was about seven ounces. Today, a small is a whopping 16 ounces, more than double the size of the 1970s. With Disneyland prices, I'm not sure that a 1970s size drink would fly, but perhaps there could be a display about drink sizes back then and now to spark family conversations on the topic. Halfway down Main Street from Coke Corner is the Market House. The Market House essentially became a Starbucks in 2013. But before that, the Market House not only sold snacks, drinks, and merchandise, but also was a place where you could amuse yourself by playing a game of checkers or by picking up an antique wall-mounted telephone with which you could eavesdrop into a party line conversation that was taking place. Party lines were largely phased out by the 1970s, so I think a more appropriate option for a 1970s Main Street could be retro telephones with which you could call a Disney character. This actually did exist in the 1970s in Tomorrowland at the exit of the America the Beautiful Circle Vision film. But those phones only had static recordings of characters talking. With today's technology, you could have Mickey, Minnie, Donald, or Goofy have an interactive conversation with you. The 1970s had a mix of still novel push button phones and rotary phones. Rotary phones had the numbers displayed in the shape of a circle 
There was a disc on top of the numbers with a hole over each number. You stuck your finger into the desired hole and rotated the disc all the way around for each number in the phone number you're dialing. The old market house also had a game of checkers sitting out for you to play with a friend. While kids did still play checkers in the 1970s, a better representation of the 1970s would be a handheld electronic game. The market house could sell them as well as have them on display for you to play freely. I envision the 1978 Simon game would bring the older generation right back to being a kid, while the younger generation could be amused by how incredibly simple games used to be. While we're at it, why not have a few beanbag chairs available that you can relax on while playing a game of Simon or 1977's Mattel Electronics Football? As for restaurants, Carnation Ice Cream Parlor, now called Carnation Cafe, is located in the heart of Main Street. Its current outdoor space was originally the flower market, and Carnation Carnation was only indoors. Then in 1977, the flower market moved across the street next to the market house, making space for Carnation to expand outside. In 1997, the Blue Ribbon Bakery took over the inside spot, making Carnation strictly an outdoor restaurant until 2012. When down the street, the Jolly Holiday Bakery opened, so the decision was made to close up shop at the Blue Ribbon Bakery and let Carnation once again occupy both the inside and outside areas. What could be done with this restaurant in a 1970s themed Main Street? One idea is to serve 1970s foods, such as fondue, a pot of melted cheese that you dip bread or meat into. Quiche, Watergate salad, a concoction of pistachio pudding, canned pineapple, whipped topping, crushed pecans, and marshmallows. And Julia Child's famous beef bourguignon recipe. Or perhaps the restaurant would be similar to the Primetime Cafe in Disney's Hollywood Studios, where you eat dinner in front of the TV, but instead of eating at a table 1950s style, you could eat from a TV tray on the couch, 1970s style. The food could be served frozen TV dinner style, but make it restaurant quality food. While the atmosphere can be 1970s, let's make the food quality better. Of course, the TV would play shows like The Brady Bunch, Happy Days, The Partridge Family, Good Times, and of course, The Wonderful World of Disney. A look at Main Street would not be complete without a look at the stores. The Emporium is the largest store, not just on Main Street, but the entire park. It is themed to a department store in the early 20th century. A 1970s themed Emporium could be a two-story department store similar to the Broadway, but with a lot of Disney merchandise mixed in. My sister worked in the wig department in a Broadway department store in the 1970s, so why not have a wig department inside the Emporium? In addition to some afros and wild 1970s haircuts, you could also sell wigs of Disney princesses. Beyond all the Disney merch, there could be a smattering of puka shells, macrame plant hangers, and pet rocks. Yes, in the 1970s, we all bought a pet rock. What is a pet rock, you ask? Well, in 1975, actual rocks from Rosarito Beach in Baja, California, Mexico, were packaged individually in a small box, packaged with straw and breathing holes so that you could keep your pet rock alive and comfortable. Pet rock creator, Gary Dahl, laughed all the way to the bank. The Emporium could also sell mood rings, lava lamps, and Viewmasters. The Candy Palace originally was its own store independent of the Penny Arcade. The Candy Palace sat between the Coca-Cola Refreshment Corner, and the Penny Arcade, making and selling candy. The smell of the candy being made fresh is pumped out onto Main Street to entice your sweet tooth into coming in for a treat. In addition to classic candy, a 1970s candy palace would also sell nostalgic 1970s candy, especially Pop Rocks. Starting around 1975-76, Pop Rocks were sold in a packet filled with little bits of hard candy with pressurized carbon dioxide gas bubbles. So when the candy dissolved in your mouth, the candy would explode in your mouth and create a popping sound. Pop rocks tasted like there was a party in your mouth and everyone's invited. Main Street has had a wide variety of different types of shops over the years, ranging from the Upjohn Company Pharmacy, the Storybook Shop, Main Street Magic Shop, and the Fine Tobacco Shop. In a 1970s themed Main Street, there could be a vinyl record store selling music from the 1960s and 70s, and a sporting goods store that sells wooden tennis rackets, skateboards, and roller skates. Roller skates were so popular in the 1970s that perhaps there could be a roller rink, or at minimum, 
The custodians and the balloon vendors could wear them as they travel up and down the 1970s Main Street. Main Street has always been the home for parades and street shows. Disco music was an enormous fad in the late 70s. Everyone, from adventurous grandparents to little kids, were learning to disco dance. Mickey and Minnie Mouse were no strangers to disco music. In fact, our favorite mice came out with their own disco album in 1979, Mickey Mouse Disco. A Mickey Mouse Disco street party could get guests dancing in the streets each afternoon. Now I want to hear from you. Do you think guests would respond to a 1970s Main Street? What would you like to see in a 1970s themed Main Street? Let me know in the comments section below. I make videos about topics as diverse as language and linguistics and travel destinations to videos about Disney theme parks. Click like and subscribe right now to not miss any future episodes of the Palm Springs Linguist. Choose from one of these great episodes. See you in the next video.